This Sunday, literally hundreds of millions of Christians around the world will hear the Easter story of the encounter between the two disciples and the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Few, however, will hear mention of Emmaus today or what has happened there in our lifetime. In an article published by If Americans Knew, Alison Weir writes, In 1967, after Israel launched the Six-Day War, Israel expelled the inhabitants of Emmaus and obliterated almost all traces of the village, along with two other nearby Palestinian villages. This was part of an Israeli strategy, in the words of an Israeli historian, to take over as much of Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians as possible. The Israeli journalist Amira Haas describes Emmaus before it was levelled. There were schools, mosques, an ancient church, olive presses, paths to the fields, orchards, streams, mountain air, sabra bushes, carob and olive and deciduous trees, harvested fields, graves, water cisterns, but then Israel brought in the bulldozers and destroyed and detonated and trampled, not for the first time and not for the last. And the owners of all that beauty, the elderly, the children, the infants, heard and watched the explosions from a kilometre or two away. The village's inhabitants then trekked for days through the mountains of Ramallah, leaving their belongings behind. Four seniors and a one-year-old baby died along the way. The elderly and the disabled residents who were unable to leave their homes, however, had their homes demolished on top of them. Eighteen were murdered, buried underneath the rubble. As author Grace Halsell wrote in a powerful essay, most Christians are unaware of what they do not know about Israel. They're indoctrinated by US supporters of Israel in their own country. And when they travel to the land of Christ, most did so under Israeli sponsorship. But what is both so ironic as well as deeply tragic is the fact that many contemporary Christians share the same false expectation of Jesus as did the two disciples walking on that road from Jerusalem to Emmaus just a week after the resurrection. Let's explore Luke 24 together and note first of all confusion about the redemption of Israel. Confusion about the redemption of Israel. We begin to read at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. But the chief priests and their rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. But in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb earlier this morning, but they didn't find the body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels 
who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. That's Luke 24, 13 to 24. What do we learn about these two disciples? Well, we can observe that they were depressed and confused. Why was that? Because of their answers to the two most important questions in life. Who is Jesus and why did Jesus come? Verse 19, they thought he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And they knew he'd been crucified. You see, they saw Jesus as a prophet, but a dead prophet. Second question, why did they think Jesus had come? We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Let that answer sink in. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Well, if Jesus was not redeeming Israel on the cross, what on earth was he doing? You see, they were looking for a political messiah, a prophet who would liberate Israel politically from their Roman occupiers, give them back their sovereignty and independence as they had under David and Solomon briefly. But he was dead and their hopes were shattered. You see, because they didn't know who Jesus is, they couldn't understand why Jesus came. They were confused and depressed because they were ignorant, ignorant of the scriptures, and they had forgotten the promises Jesus had made repeatedly through his life. They thought they knew about Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus personally, even though he was walking beside them right now. Many of Jesus' followers today, it seems, share perhaps these same aspirations. You see, even in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 6, after recognising Jesus as their Lord and King, just as he is about to ascend to heaven, they ask him, verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In his commentary, John Calvin writes, there are as many mistakes in this question as there are words. Let me elaborate. John Stott, in his commentary on the Acts of the Apostles, appraises the errors they had made. The errors these two disciples on the road to Emmaus were making too. Quote, The mistake they made was to misunderstand both the nature of the kingdom and the relation between the kingdom and the spirit. Their question must have filled Jesus with dismay. Were they still so lacking in perception? The verb, the noun, and the adverb of their sentence all betray doctrinal confusion about the kingdom. For the verb restore shows they were expecting a political and territorial kingdom. The noun Israel that they were expecting a national kingdom. And the adverbial clause at this time they were expecting an immediate kingdom. But in his reply, verses 7 and 8, Jesus corrects their mistaken notions of the kingdom's nature, extent and arrival. Since the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, the disciples may be forgiven for still holding to an old covenant understanding of the kingdom, with the re-establishment of the monarchy and liberation from the brutal colonisation of Rome. But had they been present at Jesus' trial, they would have perhaps remembered things differently. There Jesus explained, quote, John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You see, Jesus repudiated the notion of an earthly, a nationalistic kingdom on more than one occasion. Least of all, one based on ethnicity or race. 
This is why in reply to the disciples, Jesus says that he has another agenda for them. He said in Acts 1.8, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the Holy Spirit. When the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated would, in contrast to their narrow expectations, be spiritual in character, international in membership and gradual in expansion. And that expansion of this kingdom throughout the world would specifically require their exile from the land. They were to turn their backs on Jerusalem and their hopes of ruling there with Jesus in order to fulfill their new role as ambassadors of his kingdom. So if we're looking for contemporary application, on the basis of these passages, we can say with conviction that Jesus repudiates all forms of racialized nationalism, whether it's manifest in white supremacism, black supremacism, segregation or apartheid. And Christian Zionism is just one further example of this false theology based on ignorance of scripture and confusion about the redemption of Israel. The church hasn't replaced Israel. They are one and the same. It's only ever been one people of God. God's Old Testament saints, God's New Testament saints, made up of all languages, all tribes, all nations on the basis of grace through faith, not law, not race, not works. You see, today people misunderstand why Jesus came because they're ignorant of who Jesus is. And Jesus answers that question in his reply. Secondly, I want us to notice not only the confusion as to the redemption of Israel, notice the centrality of Jesus Christ in all the scriptures. Luke 24, verse 25. Jesus said to them, How foolish you are! How slow to believe all the prophets have spoken! Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, Jesus gently rebukes them for their foolishness. Foolish because they clearly did not believe what God had promised in the scriptures. You see, they had an Israel-centred view of Scripture like many Zionists today. And so to remedy this, Jesus gives them a unique biblical overview. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. Do you see that? All the Scriptures Jesus walks them through the Hebrew scriptures to show them that he, not Israel, is central to God's redemptive plan for the world. The golden thread running through the entire Old Testament centres on the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ from Genesis on, from his conception, his birth, his life, his teaching, his claims, his miracles, his betrayal, his torture, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension and his return were all prophesied hundreds of years before they happened. Jesus' coming was no accident but central to God's redemptive plan for the world. Now, if you'd like to explore this further, I recommend a book, A. M. Hodgkin's book, Christ in All the Scriptures. It's a classic and you can get it online easily from any good bookstore. 
You may also like to explore a teaching series I gave when I was the Vicar of Christchurch in Virginia Water. Uh, they show how every central character in the Old Testament, every key event, every prophecy, every feast, every festival, reveals ever more brightly the person and work of God's anointed Son. The Lord Jesus is revealed to be the Passover lamb, the scapegoat, the atonement, the bronze serpent, the kinsman redeemer, the suffering servant, the bridegroom, the prince of peace, son of David, lord of David, messiah, high priest, temple and God's anointed son. And uh, in the uh, text of this uh, sermon, which you'll find a hyperlink to below uh, this video, uh, you can find direct links to that whole series uh, that stretches from uh, uh, Genesis to uh, Malachi. What a Bible study Jesus must have given them on that road to Emmaus. It could be summarized, however, in one sentence. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. On the road to Emmaus, we've seen their confusion about the redemption of Israel. We've discovered the centrality of Jesus Christ in all the scriptures. And finally, we see that conviction comes from the word and spirit. We read from verse uh, 28, quote, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognised him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and said, It is true, the Lord has risen. He's appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Luke 24, 28 to 35. When you think of Jesus, what kind of image do you have? Can you imagine Jesus laughing, laughing at a joke or playing one on his disciples? Is there space for humour in your image of Jesus? And look at the text. I suggest Jesus is being playful with his disciples here. Pretending that he was going on further, they plead with him to stay because they want more of him. They are hungry. So he feeds them. Then at the meal, he takes the bread and I imagine spoke the words from the Last Supper. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But at that very moment when they recognise him, he disappears. Do you find that strange? I don't. Garth Hewitt, in one of his songs, describes the Lord as the fast God. A fast God always leaving just when we are arriving. Or as C.S. Lewis describes God in his book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Aslan is on the move. That's just what we see here. Just as they understand, Jesus leaves. But notice the lasting impact of their encounter with Jesus. There is an internal impact and an external one. First, the internal. Quote, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Verse 32. You see, when the scriptures are expounded, when we realise the scriptures centre on the cross, on Jesus our Lord and Saviour, what happens? God's Holy Spirit brings not just clarity, 
but conviction and confirmation. You see, he will not allow us to get comfortable or complacent. Conviction can be unsettling, but this is intentional. As Hebrews 4 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. So first there is the inward transformation, and I hope you are sensing that as we work our way through this passage together. You see, an encounter with Jesus not only transforms us inwardly, an encounter with Jesus impacts our relationships with others. When the truth of the word of God captivates our hearts, we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to share it. Think about it. An hour earlier, they'd persuaded Jesus to stay with them because it was late. Now, gone bedtime, they do what? They're impelled to return to Jerusalem in the middle of the night to share the good news that they've encountered the risen Lord Jesus. The internal and the external work of the Holy Spirit. To know Jesus and make Jesus known. That's our purpose in life. In our passage today, we've observed confusion about the redemption of Israel, the centrality of the Lord Jesus in all the scriptures, and how conviction comes from the Word and the Spirit. What about you? Can you relate to these two disciples? Where are you on your road to Emmaus? Before or after encountering Jesus? And in which direction are you headed? Walking away from or walking toward your destiny? Are you filled with confusion or with clarity? Jesus is with us today. But do you recognise him? One way to tell is to reflect on how you are feeling. Are you discouraged today? Are you confused? Is it because the Jesus you thought you knew has not fulfilled your hopes or answered your prayers? Is it because your understanding of redemption is deficient? You see, there are many false gospels in circulation today, from the prosperity gospel, promising health and wealth, to a white gospel or a black gospel fusing faith with race, with the flag or with nationalism. As I said earlier, Christian Zionism is just another popular but deviant gospel. Has this exposition made your heart burn as the Holy Spirit has opened up today's gospel reading to you? Well, that's my hope and prayer. Because life is a journey and we're all travellers on the road. The scriptures assure us that Jesus is travelling with us by his Spirit. Surely, he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. Like these two disciples, God speaks to us today from his word. May he bring you clarity of who Jesus is and why Jesus came. May he encourage and motivate you to share with others what he has shown you, what he is accomplishing in and for and through you. For this is our purpose, for we are Easter people to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. God bless you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.